Okay, uh, we're uh, Jesus the God-man. Look at Jesus in John's Gospel. This is lesson number seven. Open your Bibles to John chapter three. And we're studying in the Gospel of John and focusing on how Jesus Himself is portrayed in the Gospel of John. We see Him described as the God-man. That's kind of a term we've used, the God-man, the one with both a physical and a divine uh, nature. We also see some recurring themes talked about how, how John is writing this, how he's putting together his material. Uh, we see Jesus putting forth evidence of his divine nature, human nature. We see some people react to him with faith, others react to him with disbelief. So in our last lesson we examined the dialogue between Jesus and a leader and a teacher in Israel at that time called Nicodemus, that, that dialogue that went on between them, very interesting. And in their conversation Nicodemus tried to understand as Jesus revealed to him the requirements needed to enter into the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus accepted the fact that Jesus did the miracles and the miracles you know, they were from God, but Nicodemus' problem was believing that Jesus was God. And you know, I mean, let's not be too hard on the guy. That was a, that's a pretty big concept to get your mind around. So in essence, Jesus the God-man was revealing to Nicodemus the mystery that had been kept secret for so long. And this mystery that Paul the Apostle refers to in Romans 16, 25, the mystery was how do you get to eternal life? So the, you know, they, they call you know, John 3, especially 1 to 16, you know, the golden passage in the, in the Bible. And one of the reasons they call it that is because it, it compresses in very few words the mystery of eternal life. And so Jesus says to Nicodemus, you had to be changed. You have to be reborn in the spirit and in, in the water. And of course, as I say, it was hard for Nicodemus to understand because Jesus had not yet died on the cross. He had not yet risen. So he didn't have all the information that we have. But for now, in preparation for all of this, the change he needed to make was to humble himself in the presence of Jesus and be baptized to purify his soul. In other words, to demonstrate. It's the same thing then as it is now. They were baptized then as an expression of faith that they were you know, expecting the kingdom to come and the Messiah to come. Today, we're baptized again as an expression of faith that Jesus takes away our sins and gives us the Holy Spirit. Of course, later on, as the gospel would be preached, the details of the kingdom would be explained. Nicodemus would then be able to grasp much more fully the meaning and the value of what Jesus was giving to him. So as I said last time in John chapter 3 verse 16, summarizes God's plan and His purpose for sending Jesus. So in our lesson today I want to review this plan of salvation and compare it to other plans other plans of salvation, and also why it was rejected, why God's plan was rejected. You know, when we study other major religions in the world, um, we see that they also have plans of salvation. That's not unique to us as Christians. So I, the, today I want us to look at very briefly other religions and their plan of salvation. Maybe make some comparisons. Now major religions have traditionally been divided into four main groups. The first main group of religions, the Near Eastern religions, the Middle East, the West, the North. Near Eastern religions and their subdivisions are the ones that we are the most familiar with. For example, Judaism, Historically, 1400 BC, I mean, historians peg it at you know, Moses, begins with Moses. I mean, we know it begins earlier than that. I'm talking, if you were taking a course you know, in college on comparative religion, they would say, okay, Judaism about 1400, 1500 BC with Moses. 
Their concept of salvation is based on obedience to the law of Moses and cultural identity. If you're a Jew, you belong to the group, and that group is God's people, so for them, that's salvation. And if you obey the law, then you're, you know, you're saved. Uh, another religion of that area, Zoroastrianism, 600 BC. Uh, not many Zoroastrians left. But at the time, uh, salvation for that group was based on the doing of good and certain worship rituals, especially using fire. So if you did good, if you were like a good person and you, you know, followed through on the, uh, on the rituals, you know, that was your form of salvation. Islam, another um, Near Eastern religion, salvation is based on completing the five pillars. And the five pillars in Islam, the first is confession. There is only one God and Muhammad is his prophet. That's the confession you have to make. Second is the giving of alms, the zakat, two and a half percent. The third pillar is daily prayer, God is great. You know, the, they pray five times a day. That's the third pillar of Islam. Fourth pillar, fasting during the holy days of Ramadan. And the fifth pillar of Islam, the, you know, what we say the process of salvation, the fifth pillar is pilgrimage, to go to Mecca once in your life, the holy city. Now there's another way to guarantee salvation for a, a Muslim and that's through jihad, holy war, and the reason that that's a sure thing is because even if you do the five pillars, there's still a chance that you don't make it to paradise. In Islam, you know, Allah is a kind of fickle at times. You, know, you think you, you never know. And if you don't make it, well, Allah is great anyways. You know what I mean? Who, who am I? And so within that religion, the idea of jihad is very alluring to young men because there's no doubt about it. If you die doing jihad, then you're guaranteed. There's no, you know, no doubt whatsoever you're going to make it to paradise. Jihad, holy war. Yeah, it's a word that means holy war. It means defending Islam against infidels. And then, of course, the fourth religion in the Near Eastern group is Christianity. Uh, you know, when you study comparative religion, Christianity is categorized as a Near Eastern religion. They're categorized geographically. And we're going to discuss the plan of salvation in more detail a little bit later on. But suffice to say, in Christianity, salvation is based on faith, faith of the, uh, of the believer. Then there's another group, the Eastern religions, mostly India. Most Eastern religions resemble one another. There are a lot of them, but there are really three source religions that give life to all the other religions in the Eastern group. First is Hinduism. Hinduism is the oldest organized religion that still exists. Their concept of salvation for Hindus is the continual improvement of yourself in various ways for a number of lifetimes until you reach moksha. So the idea of reincarnation is not a blessing, it's a curse. You keep coming back till you get it right. <laughs> you keep moving up. Okay? In Hinduism, the reason why the cows are sacred is that they believe that that's the embodied spirit in the cow is one step away from moksha. That's why you're not allowed to kill a cow, because if you kill a cow, you, you're taking away the opportunity of an individual who in the next life We'll go to Moksha. Uh, their concept of salvation is a, you, know, you merge with deity. It's not a, the deity is not a personal being, but rather a force of nature into which you merge unconsciously, like a drop of water falling into the, into the ocean. Uh, the other religion is Jainism. Again, uh, not many Jainists left, but it was at one time very powerful, 500 BC roughly. Their idea of salvation comes by total renunciation of the flesh and its pleasures. No sex, no personal relationships, no personal uh, possessions. And so what they did is uh, it's familiar to Hinduism, except they said you don't have to keep coming back. You can get to moksha in one lifetime. One lifetime. But that lifetime you will, you will deny everything to yourself. 
and then seek it. Like I said, there's a lot more we can say about these religions, but I just want to focus in on their concept of salvation. And then Sikhism, 1400 AD, it's not that old a religion. Uh, you know, the Sikhs, they wear the turbans and so on and so forth, Sikh temples. Their idea of salvation, you love God, you do good. That's the way to, uh, to moksha, the doing of good works. And then there are the Far Eastern religions, mostly Asia. Confucianism, the idea in salvation, there's no, no formal worship, there's no formal deity in Confucianism. Uh, you develop personal virtues, especially in the leaders of the country. I, I would suppose for Confucianism, social maturity and social order is as close as you get to paradise, because there's no afterlife. Uh, in, a, in China today, still very much influenced by Confucian uh, thinking. Order, you know, things are done in an orderly way. Uh, virtues, uh, so it's a, a self-improvement but on a, on a, on a social level. Uh, Shinto, Shinto rather, the uh, state religion of Japan in the past. They had no concept of salvation except to keep the Japanese nation supreme. And so um, uh, their, own, their form of worship, I suppose, was the veneration of past family members. That was their main ritual, if you wish. Uh, no concept of personal you know, salvation, rather a corporate salvation for the nation. Buddhism, 500 BC, um, the idea of salvation in Buddhism, you abandon physical desire to possess things, and when you lose the desire to possess things, then that frees you. And this freedom from desire to possess, this is salvation. That state that you enter into when you're free of the, of the desire to possess anything, you finally reached it. They call it nirvana. Uh, so the method is to renounce everything. When you cease to be, then you become. That's the whole idea behind uh, Buddhism. And then Taoism. Taoism, uh, to be in harmony with one's surroundings because you have no power to shape who or what you are. And so salvation for a Taoist comes from balancing the yin and the yang by fitting into your surroundings, if you wish. That's why in China many times in older rural, you know, the roads don't go straight, you know, they go crooked, they go around and around because of, of this type of thinking. You, know, you don't want to disturb a tree. You, go, you build the road around the tree and around the rock and around the mountain and so on and so forth. Because you want to be in harmony with, you know, with nature. Here in America we don't have that, so if we want to go from A to B, what do we do? We just get the bulldozers out, Right? Straight ahead. And then there are miscellaneous religions. Some religions don't fit into any category. They're not really well organized, but they're widely practiced. Animism, for example, is not a formal or organized religion, but animistic beliefs are common among peoples, especially primitive people. South America and Africa, primitive peoples worship in an animistic way. For them, um, for their salvation, if you wish, salvation is found by appeasing the spirits with gifts and finding ways to be safe from them. Appeasing the gods, building totems. So most nature religions that, that, that worship the sun or the water or the animals, those are what we call animistic religions. And then there's naturalism, 1700 AD, naturalism is not a religion but a belief system. It believes that there's nothing spiritual, everything is material. That's why they call it naturalism, materialism. There's no afterlife, there's no soul, there's no spirit. And so finding happiness and contentment in this world by self-actualization, you know, you can be the best you can be, that's, that's naturalism. Follow your heart, that's naturalism. 
You hear Oprah saying that all the time. She, she mixes all kinds of religions in a kind of a stew. You know? So each of the 12 main religions that I've briefly described, they each have their concept of salvation. And although they have different approaches, the 11 religions have only three ways that they put forward for an individual to obtain salvation. Listen now, all these religions, all these billions of people throughout history, throughout all these countries, all of these practices, if you wish, and all the subcategory of, of these 11 main religions, and they only have three, they've only come up with three ways, three concepts for, quote, salvation, for, for happiness. Or, all right, here they are, three. One, by doing religious exercises, religious rituals, ceremonies, from the shaman who is in the, in the, in the, in the jungles, you know, uh, who is mixing uh, crushed monkey skulls and, you know, uh, and, and, and putting a curse you know, from that to the very organized religions you know, that, that uh, you have to have a ritual, you know, to the Mormons who have rituals, their sacred temples. Or salvation by doing good works. You know, Hinduism, what is it? Well, what's their system? You get to be born again over and over, not born again like we think about, but you, you're reincarnated over and over again until you get it right. You don't want any bad karma. You know, your motivation is you want to be a better person. Why? Because by improving yourself, you're getting closer and closer and closer to moksha. And the third one is by doing a combination of meditation and asceticism. In other words, denial. Deny yourself, deny food, deny uh, you know, marriage, whatever. And it, when it came to salvation, they only offered two possible scenarios of what that salvation was. So 11 religions only come up with three different methods and those three different methods promise one of only two outcomes. One, a physical paradise, either now or later, I mean, Muslims, you know, the fact that paradise has 72 virgins. And think about that, is that heaven? You know, well, that, that's heaven on earth you know, for some repressed Muslim man. Or absorption into the, a greater power. So some sort of physical paradise or some sort of, you know, I no longer am, I'm part of the force. That's it. Those are the options. Now the majority of people on the earth have sought these two objectives by pursuing these three ways while practicing one of the 11 major religions. I know that's a lot in 10 minutes, you know, but basically it's what it is. So when we look at Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus, we see another view of salvation pursued in a radically different way. So for comparative religion courses in college, they place Christianity as the fourth major religion in the Near Eastern section, because again, of its geography, where it started. It's put there because historically and geographically, it is similar to the other three religions. You know, it's similar to Islam and Judaism, Zoroastrianism, uh, because those are monotheistic religions. They only worship, you know, Islam only has one God, Zoroastrianism, one God. Judaism, one God. Christianity, one God. That, but that's where the similarity ends. Christianity as a religion by virtue of its fulfilled prophecy, witnessed miracle, uh, written revelation, and its impact on the world is in a class all by itself. There are no other religion that even comes close to it if you really compare. You know, we say, oh, it's not polite you know, to talk about religion, you know, and now we mustn't. You know. Because if we do, we find out how superior Christianity is from every perspective, and that's just not politically correct. It's, it's okay in sports, it's okay for Muhammad Ali to say, I'm the greatest, and then go out and beat up everybody to prove it, or Mike Tyson, you know, that I'm, I'm the baddest, and go out there and bite off you know, one of his opponent's ears or a baseball player, or, you know, it's okay for those people to, to brag about how great they are and then go ahead and prove it on the court or on, in the rink or whatever. But it's unseemly for a Christian to brag, right? 
And yet, if you compare the religions, Christianity, is so, there is no number two. Let's put it that way. In John 3, 14 to 16, Jesus reveals God's plan of salvation and man's response to it. This is why I've devoted so much time to it here. In verse 14 and 15, Jesus summarizes the essence of God's plan to save man by tying together an event from the past with an event that was to take place in the future. So let's read that in verse 14 and 15. Jesus says now to Nicodemus, he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. So in this, Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus that the plan that God had for change, that's salvation. He had previewed this plan in the Old Testament and he would accomplish through him, through Jesus in the near future. In other words, the mystery, he previewed that mystery in the Old Testament and he'd reveal it through Jesus you know, in the future, well, Nicodemus' future. Now the episode with the snake in the desert was a preview of his method of salvation. So let's take a look at that. It's in Numbers 21. It says, um, then they set out, they were, the, the, the Israelites are in the desert, okay, with Moses in the wanderings. Then it says, they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food, the, the manna that uh, God was giving them. And so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many of the people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that we may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on a standard, and when it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. So in this story, we're able to see the spiritual principles at work. First, that disobedience is sin. This is the hardest thing to convince people of nowadays. There was a time that people understood that disobedience <laughs> was sin, but they didn't care. They went ahead and did it anyways. Nowadays, you get people arguing with you that disobedience is sin. But that's a spiritual principle. If you disobey God's laws, you die. I mean, you die in the sense that you're separated from Him and ultimately will be separated from Him for an eternity. That's what death is, not just having a heart attack and your heart stops. Secondly, the penalty for sin is suffering and death. And then the third principle, salvation is based on a system of faith. All the other religions that I talked to you about, salvation was based on a system of work, system of law, system of activity, system of ritual keeping, so on and so forth. But in Christianity, salvation is based on a system of faith. The salvation from sin and death is achieved when God provides an atonement or a payment for sin and man believes and trusts that God's atonement removes his sins and thus saves him. So in the Old Testament story, the disobedience and murmuring of the people was sinful. The penalty was inflicted by the poisonous snake sent by God. The atonement was represented by a bronze figure on a pole, bronze figure of a snake. And the response of faith and trust was expressed as the people looked upon the bronze snake and uh, that was attached to the pole. Notice they didn't say anything, they didn't touch it, they didn't have to do backflips. Moses simply said, if you're inflicted, if you're bitten by the snake, if you're poisoned, then if you go and look upon it, you will be saved, you'll survive. So in John 3.15, Jesus looks ahead to His crucifixion and He establishes this as God's final atonement and payment for all sins. The sins are every act of disobedience by everyone at any time. The penalty is not just poisonous snakes, but the eternal death of hell. That's the penalty. 
The atonement of God is Jesus' perfect life offered as a sacrifice on the cross at Calvary. Why a perfect life? Well, Adam had a perfect life. He was created perfect and he sinned. He forfeited his perfect life and everyone afterwards forfeits their life through sin. So what do you think you need to you know, atone for a perfect life that was forfeited through sin? Well, you need another perfect life. That's why I can't die for you or you can't die for me because that's an imperfect life for an imperfect life. You need a perfect life offered up for the original perfect life that was forfeited through sin. And the response of faith and trust in Jesus is now not going in front of the cross, because He's not in front of the cross, He's not on the cross anymore, but rather in repentance and baptism, which, if you will, relives the cross of Christ. Uh, and this is what was explained to Nicodemus. So um, the salvation and the way to it is summarized in verse 16. For God so loved the world, that's the motivation, that's the grace part, that He gave His only begotten Son, that's the atonement part, that's the payment for sin. And that shows how special Jesus is, the only begotten, He's the only one like that. He's the God-man, <clears throat> that whoever believes in Him, there's the system, faith, a system of faith shall not perish, but have eternal life, there's the promise. There's the promise. There's the salvation. So the salvation and the way to it is summarized in this brief verse. We see that God's salvation is not a continuous cycle of life that ends in oblivion. It is not a paradise of physical pleasure. It's an individual, personal, never-ending experience of life with a new body on a level and in a dimension that can only partly be described with terms such as peace and joy and purity and power and love and wisdom and so on and so forth. You know, I was thinking the other day, uh, it was a, a very lovely day, and uh, just, you know, you have these good days once in a while. Oh, you know, your wife makes your favorite meal and it's just a nice day out and you know, the grandkids come over and you enjoy them and you're thinking, Oh, I, life can be so pleasant sometimes, so delightful. You know? And I was thinking, wow, if God has created us and created the world in such a way that we can experience these pleasures, can you imagine what the pleasure will be like in heaven where there's no sin, where there's no end to it? So God's way of salvation is through faith, not the doing of religious exercises, not meditation, mysticism, or philosophy, not the performance of good works, not the denial of the body. I mean, some of these things have good value. You know what I'm saying? But only in the context of Christian living. Yes, I do deny my body certain things. You know, that fourth helping of ice cream, okay, I'll say no. You know, I mean, you know, denying yourself certain things you know, that are not bad in themselves, but still, you know, uh, if, you, if, you, if your blood sugar is too high, well, you, know, you have to be careful. You have to you know, deny your body certain things that you would like to have, and so on and so forth. But these are not things that make you right or loving in God's sight. What makes you loving in God's sight is that you love His Son. So, yes, faith in Jesus is expressed through repentance and baptism and sincere Christian living. And so the reason God set this plan in motion is because He so loved the world God's justice sends forth judgment and punishment for sin. That's an absolute surety. Just as sure as when God said, let there be light and the lights appeared, you, we can be just as sure that He says there will be punishment, there will be a judgment for sin. That's a sure thing. And God's love sends forth Christ to absorb the punishment and offer forgiveness based on faith. He absorbs our punishment. Now the reason these other religious systems fail is because none of them provide mankind with what he needs, and that is an atonement for sin. None of them. Nobody deals with sin. And if they do deal with sin, they let the individual deal with sin. You've got to deal with it. Okay, we'll give you a, a, an endless number of lifetimes to deal with it. So Jesus reveals to Nicodemus the plan of salvation. I want you to get the, if you don't understand anything else, I want you to understand this. 
The plan of salvation is that God sends Jesus to die for our sins. That's the plan of salvation. When you're explaining the plan of salvation to somebody, you're not saying to them, here's the plan of salvation. You need to believe, you need to confess, you need to repent, you need to be baptized, you need to be faithful. That is not the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is that God sent His Son to die for our sins and He offers salvation on a basis of faith, not on a basis of works. That's the plan of salvation. That we believe and repent and are baptized, so on and so forth. That's our response to the plan of salvation. So many times you know, we say, well, I explained to him the plan of salvation, and you know, they didn't answer, they didn't respond. And I said, well, what did you explain to them? Well, I explained to them that they had to be baptized and it had to be by immersion and they had to live good Christian lives. Well, where's the good news there? There's no good news there. The good news is that, you know, that, that abortion you had when you were 16, you know, that's gone. And those two divorces, they're gone. And that time that you went to jail for such and such and you're a felon, that's gone. Because Christ died on the cross to erase all of that, to absorb the punishment for all of that. Oh, oh, oh that's good news. Oh yeah, that is great news. That that you can come to God and, and, and receive His forgiveness based on faith, that I believe in His Son, and not that I have to do and be perfect? Well, that's great news. So you know, don't ask, you know, why isn't the church growing and so on and so forth? A lot of times because we're not, we're not preaching the gospel, we're not preaching the good news. And so in his dialogue with Nicodemus, Jesus also reveals how mankind in general um, would actually respond to God's plan, which is God's gift. Now I need to move, I'm a little late. It says, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. If Jesus did come as judge, the entire world would be condemned. And if He came for this judgment and punishment, uh, we, it would have already been handed out. <laughs> we wouldn't be here. Jesus says that He came as Savior, not judge, so the world has an opportunity for true salvation. There'll be a time for judgment, make no mistake about that. But Jesus is coming to die on the cross. That wasn't the time for judgment, that was the time for salvation. In verse 18 he says, he who believes in Him is not judged. Listen now, that's you, that's me. He who believes in Him is not judged. Oh man, I, am, I can sleep at night. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So in a rhetorical fashion, Jesus poses the question, if Jesus didn't come to judge, then why, why are men still condemned? And the answer is that judgment is based on belief or disbelief. This is the dividing point for judgment. Some, believes, some believe, rather, and some do not. And there's no need to wait in anticipation for the last day for the results of judgment. Jesus clearly states the terms. Those who believe, they're saved. When? Now. And how, for how long? Forever. And those who disbelieve, well, they're already judged. At the end of the world, there won't be any suspense. Those who believed will take their place with God and those who disbelieve will be taken away. And I know there are other passages. Now we're, we're focusing only on John here. You know, again, you can't say everything about everything in one passage. There are other passages that say, that warn Christians to be careful not to fall away. You, you, you can lose that salvation, if, but, but how do you lose it? Well, by disbelieving, <laughs> by going back to disbelief. And your disbelief will be expressed through your actions. If you go back to sin, you go back to the world, if you, go, you know, if you go back to that, well, then you're expressing disbelief. So at the end of the world, there won't be any suspense. The charge that will condemn will be that they didn't believe in the name, in other words, His true essence, which He explains as the only begotten Son, the only one who has this God-man nature. This is the essence. When, when somebody asks you in the waters of baptism, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you say, yes, I do, what you're saying is, I believe He's the God-man. 
I believe He's the man, the historical Jesus that died on the cross, and I also believe that that person was the Son of God. He was divine. 19 and 20, it says, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who um, practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Now in the last three verses he explains why this judgment is correct, to silence those who may take exception to his pronouncement. Even Nicodemus you know, might say, well, wait a minute, you know, who are you to judge? So in verse 19 he says, the, world, um, the word light rather refers back to Jesus and the truth that, that He brings. The plan He reveals from God concerning men. You know, the light came into the world, that's you know, the, the, the mystery revealed. Jesus coming to explain who He is, that's the light. It came into the world. And when people come in contact with this light, some choose the darkness because they love sin and evil more than they love God more than they love the truth. The biggest reason why people don't respond to the gospel when you actually preach it, they love their sins more than they love God. It isn't that they can't understand, it's that they desire one thing over the other. So this is the main reason why people don't want to talk about religion or the gospel. They love the darkness that they're in, whatever that is, more than the possibility of light. That's why you know, religion's a touchy subject. Why is it a touchy subject? Because if you start talking to somebody about religion, eventually you've got to talk about sin. <laughs> and nobody wants to talk about their own sins. And that's what Jesus is saying here, be ready. The light will come into the world, but not everybody will want to step into the light. So this is why many will not convert or why certain Christians don't grow. They love their sins more than they love Christ. Verse 20, he said, oh, I'm, I'm a bit ahead of the game here. Verse 20, it says, not only do people choose the darkness over the light, once they do, they hate the light. People who hear and reject the gospel are usually its worst enemies. They speak against the church or the preacher or the Bible or against what they know is right. They run away from the light because they want to remain where they are without being bothered. And then the final verse, in the final verse, Jesus compares two people. One who comes to the light, but his love of sin brings him back into the darkness where he would rather be avoiding the light. And then the other person, he says, practices the truth. He's accepted the truth, he's let the light shine on him, and he follows the light. The one that comes to the light is not afraid of it because it does two things for him and I'm almost done here. First of all, it shows where his sins are and how to get rid of them. That's what he said to Nicodemus. You need to be born again. We, we say it in different ways, right? You need to be born again, you need to be saved, you need to wash away your sins, you need to be regenerated. There are 50 different ways to say the same thing. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. You need to be born again. And secondly, the light also reveals all the good things that God will work in a person, including eternal life. So the light just doesn't shine on what the sins are. The light also reveals this eternal life, this good news. Now other religions promise that, they, they promise part of this and they produce some of this while a person lives, but the gospel guarantees an eternity of it experienced personally, and it provides a resurrected Savior to bolster our faith and our hope. Thank, thank God for the plan of salvation, that Jesus dies on the cross and is resurrected. I should mention that also. That's a very important part of the plan. Because every time I doubt, I think of the empty grave. You know, we just went by the uh, anniversary of the bombing, the Murrow Building bombing, and Bill Day uh, a preacher here at the time, still a preacher here in Oklahoma City, his sister was killed in the bombing. And Larry King interviewed him uh, on the Larry King show. Uh, Larry King still had his show on CNN. And he asked him, he said to Bill, so he says, you're a minister, right? He said, yes. And he says, well, how do you feel uh, about God now? You know, what a question to ask. He said, how do you feel about God now uh, uh, you know, that your sister died in the bombing? And Bill Day, you know, quick on his feet, I think the Spirit you know, moved him, said, um, my sister dying 
in the bombing has absolutely nothing to do with the empty grave on Sunday morning. The grave is still empty. In other words, Jesus is still risen, no matter what bad people do, no matter my sister died, that's a tragic thing, but it has no effect on the truth that the grave was empty, Jesus resurrected. That was his, was his hope. I thought, what a, what a terrific, terrific answer by a, a Christian who had been wounded by the evil of other people at that time. All right, next week we're going to go back to the text, a little closer to the text, talk about John's witness. I thank you for your attention.